Thank you, Alfredo. It's, uh, it, it's really a real honor to be here. Uh, is that okay? I mean, do I need to use the mic? I mean, it's intimate enough? Is it uh, my, my voice carrying? Very good. Um, I, just, I, I just have to warn you that uh, I'm a serial, a serial entrepreneur, I'm an author, and I'm a talk radio host. So I'm very passionate about what I'm going to talk about today. And, and, and I even surprise myself sometimes about what I can come up with. So uh, uh, just pay uh, careful attention. We're going to take a trip around the world today. We're going to voyage back in time. We're going to meet a couple of real fascinating entrepreneurs. As we reach out into the unknown and we conquer our fears, we conquer our fears, something so necessary that we do in our country today to get our economy back on track. I, I want you also to pay careful attention because what we're going to talk about is very important, but you never know when I might whip out some David, David Copperfield-esque magic in my name. So I just want to tell you to pay close attention. I want to tell you just a little bit about my entrepreneurial experience in the media, because that's not my background. My background is as an Asian, working for an Asian trading company, and then beginning my own trading company and manufacturing facilities in Asia uh, back in the, in, in the early 80s. But a good friend of mine stayed at my home Dr. Jack Wheeler, who is the oh. credit as being the originator of the Reagan Doctrine. You know Dr. Wheeler? Very well. Okay, yeah, Jack, you know Jack very well. Well, Jack's a good friend of mine, and he was staying at my home. And uh, he uh, asked me the, the following morning after leaving uh, politics, he now has two point news. And he asked me, would I, would I write for to the point news about what's really happening out there in the world? about not from an academia point of view, but from someone who's living in the trenches of trade, someone who's fighting every day uh, to sell American products uh, to the world. Are we really that bad? Are we really that uncompetitive? I mean, after all, we have this $800 billion trade deficit that just won't go away. There are many in our country that are saying, we got to get out of manufacturing. We're now a service country. You know, you live it. Would you write about it? I said, well, Dr. Wheeler, I've never written anything but a couple of crummy time papers. <laughs> and, and how am I going to measure up? I mean, uh, at the time, his, his writers at To The Point News had more than 100 listings on Amazon. And now you want me to write with these guys? But I took up the challenge, and I wrote an article, and he, he published it. And it actually got published at a few places. And you know, one thing led to another. In his 25 years of living in Southeast Asia and fighting and competing in all the inequities that are thrown at the American exporter, the barriers, the manipulations, the distortions that we had to continue with, came pouring out. I just couldn't believe it. You know, so one thing led to another and a hundred articles and a nationally syndicated radio show and, and a book deal with Paul Gray McMillan and Conscientious Equity. Uh, the book, An American Entrepreneur Solutions to the World's Greatest Problems, uh, being published this October. So it's fascinating as an entrepreneur, you know, how one thing leads to another. You know, all my frustrations came pouring out. And, and, and I reflect back to the a movie that we all know very well, Forrest Gump. You know, you know Forrest, when he got frustrated, what did he do? He ran. And he ran and he ran and he ran. And someone finally asked him, Forest, why are you running? And he said, I don't know. It just seemed like the right thing to do. Well, writing for me just seemed to be the right thing to do, some sort of therapeutical thing that has helped me understand the plight of the American exporter and hopefully contributes in some way for making things better. Just a couple of words about my company. So you could understand uh, a little bit about that. So when I make my comments, um, you might understand a little bit more where I'm coming from. The legacy companies were manufacturers and exporters of kitchen appliances, equipments, and high-end gadgets sold to the commercial, retail, health and nutrition, and the internet markets. Uh, we do business in more than 130 countries. We are the United States national champion exporter of the year in 2008. There's only one national champion for all 50 states. It's the first time ever that a Florida company was a national champion, which is quite amazing since there's so many exporters in this state. 
And um, over the years, you know, I've acquired a number of businesses in, in, in our segment. And the first entrepreneur that I want to introduce you to is a guy named Sherman Kelly. I bought his business. The business was started in 1935. In fact, we just had our 75th anniversary in Toledo, Ohio this last weekend. And more than 2,000 people showed up to the home that this ice cream scoop was invented. Now, I don't know what they got to do in Toledo, but obviously not very much. Because <laughs> they came out, but no, this is really a fascinating story. You want to know about a real entrepreneurial story that will just, that will just warm your heart. Sherman Kelly was an engineer working in the aluminum business from Toledo, Ohio, and he was visiting Palm Beach here in Florida. And he went into an ice cream parlor in 1933, and he watched the attendant aggressively try to scoop this frozen tub of ice cream. And he went back home and he said, boy, there's got to be a better way to do that. And he patented this scoop. I can tell you that this scoop is a piece of art. Why can I tell you? It's because it's on permanent display at the Modern Museum of Art in New York as part of the humble masterpieces of the 20th century, along with the frisbee, the slinky, the post-it note, and the champagne cork. Isn't that incredible? This, 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 I think so. Why? Why is this a piece of art? Well, first of all, it's made from aluminum. Aluminum is one of the best conductors of heat. The handle is hollow. Inside, there's a glycol material. There's a liquid inside, okay? Your body heat is conducted through the aluminum into the glycol, and it heats the scoop. Wow, it's not that fascinating. So now when you're scooping ice cream, it's coming out like hot butter because you're scooping from a warm surface. Now, this is 1935. But it even gets better. You know all of these illustrations back from the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, these Norman Rockwell-esque sort of illustrations of girls with pigtails sitting at the ice cream parlor, you know, having their ice cream sundaes and their banana splits with these perfect round bowls of ice cream. Well, that could not have happened without this scoop. Because as you roll it across the tub of ice cream, it balls it up into a perfectly round ball. So you have all these beautiful balls of ice cream. So that's why it's part of American folklore. But it even gets better than that. In the 75 years since Sherman Kelly began manufacturing this scoop in his garage at the old East End in Toledo, Ohio, more than 50 million of them have been sold around the world. 50 million. And today's retail value of this, wherever you buy them, the, the, the department stores are online, is about $20. So in today's dollars, about a billion dollars, a billion dollars of economic activity has resulted because of Sherman Kelly inventing this scoop in his garage in Toledo, Ohio. So just think for a moment of all of the families that have benefited from this, that have put food on a table, have sent to kids to school and pay for health care because of this, the power of American entrepreneurs. It's absolutely stunning. And I told you to pay attention because right now we're going to do a little bit of mind reading. Okay? We're going to do a little bit of mind reading. And let me tell you, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's really worthwhile to get this right. Something amazing is going to happen to you. I'm thinking of a number from 1 to 10. And if you think you know what that number is, shout it out. Five, three, seven. 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 I told you something amazing would happen. Well, you really did. You know Dr. Wheeler and you got the scoop. So. <laughs> Oh, that one in Washington? Yeah, yeah, it's the end of November. Yeah, yes, I will be. That's fascinating. We're going to talk about that. I also bought a company called Omega. I'm just going to tell you this real quick. Is that uh, Omega uh, invented the juicer back in the, the 1940s, and they introduced it to the United States. It's a, it's a really successful company, cult-like following. 
But about seven years ago, they took their manufacturing to Asia, just like so many other people did. I bought the company about two years ago, and we're in the process of moving the production back to our facility in Fort Pierce, where this is made, by the way, made in the United States. Uh, and uh, so we're moving it back to Fort Pierce, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do. We can actually make our products now in America just as competitively as we can make them overseas. A lot of people don't believe that. But I'll also remind you that a lot of people don't realize that the United States, despite that everything that's been said, is still the world's largest manufacturing country. And not by a little. And up until recently, the United States was the world's number two exporter country. Something that we need to get back and regain. And I'll talk a lot about that in conscientious equity. You know, this presentation is about entrepreneurialism. It's not about conscientious equity. Um, conscientious equity, I will be giving a number of lectures around the country in this next couple of months. Uh, you know, I've already got 20 confirmed, and it's going to be a lot more before this thing is over. But I did just want to touch on briefly about conscientious equity. Uh, because I'll tell you this, and, and, and the subtitle of the book is An American Entrepreneur's Solutions to the World's Greatest Problems. So, you know, I didn't think of a small thing to try to solve. I just decided I'd just solve the whole world's problems. I, if I'm going to write a book, I might as well go for it, right? But I'll tell you this, that getting our economy back on track is not a partisan thing. It is going to take Americans of all colors and stripes and polka dots to get us back on our feet. It is imminently doable. A few things we need to do. And I address that in Conscientious Equity, a roadmap, a vision. And you know the most incredible thing is that I found out in writing this book is that when we do the right thing for our country, we lift up millions and millions of citizens around the world with us. It's an incredible thing. When uh, you know, just to show you the, the bipartisanship uh, nature of the book, I'm, I'm very honored, I'm very proud. Uh, you can see on the, the flyer there, uh, Ambassador John Negroponte, you know, one of the most phenomenal American diplomats of the last hundred years, has said that conscientious equity was the way forward for economies, including our own. Bill Antholis, the managing director, director of the, of the um, Brookings Institute, has made a, a very incredible remarks. And then uh, Congressman English, I've had a number. And, and if you knew that something about these people, they're coming from very different political perspectives. And they all have come around a, uh, a conscientious equity as a way forward. So conscientious equity, conscientious because it is the right thing to do in equity because we all have ownership in doing the right thing, not just Americans. But everyone has ownership in doing the right things. By just applying simple, everyday, American entrepreneurial logic, I can solve the world's problems. I can get our economy back going again. Job creation. But I also tackle all the great social ills inflicting us and the world. Corruption, poverty, the rape of our planet, human rights, labor rights, I can address them all with just very simple American entrepreneurial logic. You know, one of the things that's happened is all this demagoguery that we're hearing on the right and the left, either you're a free trader or you're an anti-trader. You want to you know, open up our market and not expect anything in return, or you want to put your head in the sand. And, and, and there's so much demagoguery going on from the right and the left. But i got to tell you, it's a, about a whole new transaction, a whole new sort of interaction between America and the world. You know, America has an incredible opportunity to expand its opportunities overseas. But we have to know what we're doing. We have to have a vision. And there's some real structural issues that are preventing us from doing it. But when America has access to foreign markets, 
I can tell you amazing things happen. I'm one of those Americans that's out there every day fighting for my country to try to sell these things that we make, these really great, incredible things that we produce in this country. But we just don't have access to the markets in the same sort of way that foreign manufacturers have to ours. But when we do have access, we have 17 trade agreements in place right now. With those 17 countries, we have a trade surplus. A trade surplus. We sell more to them than they do us. Our problem isn't because we have too many agreements, we have too few. Consider this. Mexico buys more American products than China and Japan combined. A population of just about 100 million people buying more American products than 1.7 billion people. Why? Because we have access to the Mexican market. We don't have access to China and Japan. The United States is already a duty-free country. You know, no matter what you say or think, and all of this rhetoric about opening our markets and signing this agreement and that agreement is the, is the average tariff in the United States is less than 2%. You know, that's peanuts to pay to participate in this market. You know, some people say, well, we gotta get rid of NAFTA. A NAFTA has been the most favorable trade legislation ever signed by the United States for its manufacturers and exporters. If we were to roll back NAFTA, my, the duties charged to me would go up about 40% whereas the products entering from Mexico into the United States would go up less than 1%. Who thinks that's a good idea? Our products would be substituted out for European products. And then there's these three trade agreements that are lingering before Congress. You know, up until the 110th Congress that, uh, that, uh, that was seated the last congressional term, trade in America and, and promoting Americans' interests overseas was something that Americans came together. It was not partisan. It was very bipartisan. Well, we have three trade agreements that were signed that could immediately be creating American jobs with billions and billions and billions of more trade. Uh, one of those uh, countries is Colombia. Why would we not want to ratify our agreement with Colombia? You know, think about these, think about these uh, three numbers, which is, which is absolutely fascinating. 93, 17, and 365. 93% of Colombian exports into the United States today duty free with no tariff. Um, it's, it's, it's been that way for the last 17 years. And the last time that it was voted on by Congress to extend it, 365 members voted for it. Yet, this Congress will not let the trade agreement come for a vote that allows me the same access that Colombians have to our market. Why would we not want the American exporter to have access to that market when they already have access to our market under the most favorable conditions? And then there's South Korea. This one really gets my goat. South Korea, the world's 11th largest economy, our eighth largest, largest trading partner. If there is, there is no better example of good and evil in the world today than North Korea and South Korea. And you know what? South Korea's success was bought with American blood and treasure. 54,288 Americans died so they could be free. Why will not our Congress allow them to freely trade with us? At least just in honor of these men. And there's today 30,000 Americans still keeping the peace there. Yet this Congress will not let them trade freely with us. And who in the world could have anything against Panama? I mean, why in the world would we not ratify that agreement? And you know, the sad thing about this whole thing is, is as an American exporter, you know, these are just, these are, these are singles. I mean, these are, are, are steps forward, but they're the smallest steps forward. We need to have trade agreements with China and Japan and Brazil and in India because that's where this deficit resides. And if you give me access to those markets, my sales will boom. The American exporters' sales will boom. We don't have anything to fear. We are a very creative country. We do a lot of things very well. We just don't have access to the foreign markets. But you know, if this is going to work, it's going to be a whole new sort of coalition 
We are totally stuck in the sand right now. This isn't about free trade. The whole, the whole argument has to be taken to a whole other level. We have to create a whole new coalition that includes the people who that have concerns about environmental issues. I do too. You know, as I travel the world, it's, an, it's, it's incredible as you watch how the different people of the world get through their day. It, it's so very different. How a South Korean shop owner or a, a Indonesian gamelan musician or a, a Colombian industrialist get through their day. Very different. But there's something very universal out there. The, the feeling of, if I work hard, I need to get ahead. I need to make a, a decent wage, a livable wage. I don't want corrupt and despotic rulers to take away from me what I have. We all want a clean environment. We want safe water. We want clean air to breathe. We all respect human rights. And, and, and we don't want children to be put to work at such, such, such young ages. I mean, those are about as universal as it gets. And everyone I've met in the world from all different cultures believe in those same things. So we need to create a whole new coalition going forward to create an ideal world that's not idealized in any way. And it's not brought about by cultural chauvinism. And I believe, and I know it to be true, that if we put forward the conscientious equity accords to our trading partners, to our adversaries and our competitors, they will continue to sign on the dotted line. I want to talk uh, just briefly about, um, about uh, 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 what I call the two Mr. Friedmans. Uh, one Mr. Friedman, and you know, this is sort of where we got stuck in the sand at, is Milton Friedman. You know, Milton Friedman, everyone loves and adores Milton Friedman. I love and adore Milton Friedman. But it is stale and it's dated, and that's part of the problem that we're faced today. We need something else. We need to go beyond that. His book, Capitalism and Freedom, very, very fascinating book. Just 190 pages. And it really changed the world. And for since 1962 until today, you know, you've got a lot of Milton Friedman clones out there, you know, talking about his ideas and his principles. And it's basically this, and I'll sum it up in a couple of sentences. And he's talking about trade and how any trade agreement is a good agreement. We should just open our market wide and let anybody who has anything they want to sell come to America and sell it without any duties or tariffs and any, any sort of protections and not ask for any sort of reciprocal rights for our manufacturers. And he said, he justified it this way, and it was pretty clever. It was kind of like we were playing a prank on the world, right? And he used the Japanese as an example. You know, the Japanese bring to us all of these really cool things. At the time, there weren't cars, but there were motorcycles, and there were stereos, and there were TV sets and all these sorts of things. And we give them this paper. We give to them this paper, and it's called our currency, our dollars. Right? And, and, and he said, hey, look, they can't eat it. They can't wear it. They can't live in it. So eventually, they're going to accumulate all this paper. And they're going to find out that, hey, look, they can't do anything with it, so let's just send it back to them, and let's buy their stuff. Well, they did buy something from us that he did not predict. They bought our debt. They bought our debt, and today have us beholden to them. And the Chinese took a page right out of their book and are doing the same thing. So we did not play a prank on the world, as Mr. Friedman suggested. And then there's the other Mr. Friedman, and that's Thomas Friedman, very famous. Uh, author, New York Times journalist, wrote a book called The World is Flat. The World is Flat. And in that book, he suggests that due to the rise of information technologies, that the world has become smaller. It's become a smaller place. Anything that can be digitized can be zipped around the world in nanoseconds, allowing workers in low-cost countries like China and India to replace workers in higher cost countries at a fraction 
of the cost. And he said, because of this flattening of the world, it has created a level playing field. Well, the concept today of a flat world is just as wrong, metaphorically, as it, when it, as it, when it was when Copernicus proved it to be literally wrong. You know, Mr. Friedman has never sold or exported anything in his life. For if he did, he would understand the topography of world trade is full of insuperable mountains and rushing rivers and shifting sands. The world trading system is plagued by barriers and manipulations and distortions. Mr. Friedman, the world is not flat. The world is tilted. Our trading partners have tilted trade away from us and towards them. And we have an $800 billion trade deficit to prove it. It's not that Americans are uncompetitive. It is because the world trading system is corrupt and skewed against us. So what are we going to do about it? For that, you're going to have to spend $26.95. <laughs> I want to just tell you one story uh, from conscientious equity um, that, that's really got me rattled. And remember, conscientious equity is a vision on a way forward. And it's not about the problems, it's about the solutions. But we've got to understand the problems. And, it's, and it's, it's what I call morphine economics. Morphine economics. I'm, I'm so scared. You know, I, you know, I've been to Korea, I've been on the DMZ, and I've been there, you know, seen all that. You know, Kim Jong-il, this nutcase, you know, million men army, uh, the access to nuclear weapons, giving it to small cells, smuggling it into the country. I mean, we got a lot of things to worry about in this country. But the greatest national security threat to the United States is our debt. It is our debt. You know, I carry in my pocket, and usually it's around my neck, but today I put it in my pocket, this Lady Liberty $20 gold piece. In fact, you can see it in that photograph right there. It's actually the right piece. It's, it's this coin. It was minted in 1878. Uh, this was $20. It was one ounce of gold. $10 was a half an ounce. $5 was a quarter of an ounce. And up until 1933, this was our currency. And we continued to be on the gold standard until 1973, when during the Nixon shock, uh, Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard. And it allowed for these deficits to be accumulated. You know, at that time in 1973, it was a totally different world. Um, we started to run up these trade deficits after World War II. No one ever thought we could run up a trade deficit. We had the only manufacturing capabilities in the world. But by, by the 60s, America's economic prowess, its manufacturing prowess, had started to wane. We started to run up deficits with Switzerland and France and Italy and Taiwan and Japan. And, and our foreign trading partners, for their excess dollars, could demand gold. France and then Switzerland demanded their gold, and they got it. Well, Richard Nixon was, was scared to death. How about if the Japanese asked for gold for their surplus dollars? How about the Taiwanese? We're going to clean out Fort Knox. Well, we're going to come off the gold standard, and the dollar will no longer be tied to a hard commodity. In fact, he did it in a dramatic fashion. Just before Bonanza, in fact, he came on television uh, when everybody thought they would be seeing Little Joe and Haas, they saw Richard Nixon closing the gold window, is what they saw. Uh, but it was very popular. And, but what if, what if some despotic, corrupt ruler in our country happened to get a hold of the allegorical printing press and turned our currency into vapor paper? What if? Now, i got to tell you, I've lived overseas almost my entire adult life. I've visited just about everywhere. And I've seen what happens when corrupt despotic leaders get a hold of the printing press. The Philippines, Indonesia, Nigeria, Argentina. The list goes on and on and on and on. And you know, these people that I've lived with, it's so sad. They work their whole lives. And they accumulate. And they wait for 
a time to retire. And they have just enough. Then all of a sudden, poof, it's all gone. The currency is worthless. You know, if, if our dollars were as plentiful as sand on the beach, how much do you think that they would be worth? Today, our federal budget to run our government is $4 trillion. In the history of the world, we have mined as a human civilization, it is estimated to be $5 trillion. We spend almost as much as a country every year has been mined in gold throughout the history of the human civilization. Right? Isn't that been a bit out of control? I want to tell you about this great empire one of the greatest empires that ever existed, the Chinese Empire, back in the uh, beginning or the late 18th century, the Chinese Empire extended from the Pacific continental shores of the Pacific Ocean all the way to the Indus Pagactic Plain in India. All of what is in Eastern Russia, Southeast Asia, the Korean Peninsula was all theirs. This incredible empire, incredible empire, the British in 1798 sent an embassy to China, headed by Lord McCartney, to meet with Emperor Ken Long. He was granted an audience. But the emperor, emperor derisively addressed the British ambassador. He says, we possess all things. We don't find your manufacturers ingenious or useful. We don't need your things. We can produce whatever you can produce better. He dismissed the British ambassador. Shortly after that, for their tea and for the silk, the Chinese demanded to be paid in gold. We don't need, we don't need your manufacturers. Sound familiar? We don't need your manufacturers. We just want your gold. You want our tea? You pay in gold. Well, the British needed to do something very quickly. They needed a commodity on which they could trade. They were addicted to tea. And by this time, Ceylon, or today Sri Lanka, had become this British hacienda of tea growers. So what they did is they created an illegal trade. They went to the Gagactic Plain, and they got opium and they brought it into China through South China, and they illegally traded opium. Well, Emperor Qin Long you know, deemed that illegal. He tried to stop them, and that resulted in the opium wars of 1838 and 1862, and the, what is known as the unequal treaties that the British forced upon the Chinese, the Treaty of, of uh, Tianjin and the Treaty of Nanking. And in the first treaty, China was disgraced. Within 40 years of this incredible empire, China was disgraced. It became addicted to a terrible drug, a terrible, terrible drug. In the first treaty, the British got Hong Kong as a place to carry on trade unrestricted with China. And it could run its illegal opium trade out of there. And then in 1862, uh, uh, they got their settlement in Shanghai. And then the French and the Germans and the Russians and the Japanese all demanded settlements of their own, and they got them. The Chinese dynasty was, was prostrate. It was crawling on the floor. It was addicted to a sinister, ugly drug. Many years of civil war broke out after that. Finally, in 1912, it was the end of dynastic rule in China. And then a civil war took place. The rape of Nanjing, the, cult, the, the communist takeover in 1949, the cultural revolution in the early 60s. Would the world treat us any different than when China was, was on its knees? And, and, and the world demanded to this great empire, this culture that they all respected, they demanded blood. They demanded their, their honor and their dignity and their pride. 
And they made them suffer, and they made them pay for it, because they were brought by their knees by a drug. Well, I gotta tell you folks, this debt that we have, which is our national debt today is $13 trillion, and based on the Obama budgets, it is due to double in the next 10 years. What took us 234 years to accumulate, we will double. We will double in the next 10 years this debt. And it is scary because it is so fragile. It is a drug. And if the international community ever had a lever to play, they will play it. They played it against this great empire, China. And look what happened. And they will play it against us. Morphine economics, I gotta tell you, is a scary, dangerous thing. Now I think that wherever Emperor Qin Long may be resting today with his ancestors, he takes no solace in seeing another great empire be brought to its knees through an addiction. We must break it. We must break it. And conscientious equity, again, is a road forward and discusses this in great detail. I'm gonna, if I have time, I'm gonna come back to that, but I don't think I'm gonna have time. But I want to tell you this last story. As you know, I love to tell stories. And if I bought that stuff, I better use it. I, I, I have a collection of antiquarian maps and engravings. I'm just absolutely uh, amazed by uh, these. And uh, I have a, a collection of over a thousand pieces dating back to pre-Columbus, the world is flat. These old maps and these engravings. Uh, and, it's, it's, and I've created a museum out of it I call the Age of Discovery, the Museum of Discovery. Because after all, the, the, the Age of Discovery is fueled by trade. Trade is such a powerful, powerful thing if it's used wisely and correctly. You know, these men, back in the 15s, 16s, 1700s, on these rickety ships, accomplished so much with so little. It's incredible. The, the, the knowledge with such basic tools they had, what they were able to do. These maps that are that I'm showing you right now were published in 1775. They are published by the very famous cartographer, German cartographer, Conrad Tobias Lotter. And uh, he was one of the uh, most well-respected cartographers of his day. Now these maps are fascinating for many reasons. I mean, if you take a look at the continents, the only continent in 1775, at the birth of our nation, this is the last set of maps that would have been published before you would have seen actually the United States on a map. Right now you can see what the British possessions were. The maps after this would show actually the United States. So this would be the last map that would have been published prior to the Revolutionary War. And you can see, the North American continent is the only continent yet unexplored at that time, at the birth of our nation. In fact, it would be 30 years after this map was published that Lewis and Clark made their way up the Missouri River and, and across the continent looking for that fabled Northwest Passage. Uh, and, and Meriwether Lewis was just one years old when, that, when these maps were published. So it would be a long time before the West was actually explored. And I'm also fascinated by these maps because it is these maps that our founding fathers would have studied at great length. These maps would have been the center of so much speculation, so much discussion about this young, fledgling nation bursting onto the world scene. In fact, if Washington and Adams and Jefferson uh, were to be in Boston or New York or Philadelphia, and if they would have looked west across the Ohio Valley, they might as well have been looking at the moon. They knew about as much about this continent as they knew about the moon. In fact, George Washington himself was a cartographer, and he mapped Virginia. And he fervently believed that America's future lie west, out into the unknown, to where Americans would have to get outside of their comfort zones, and they would have to conquer their fears. But let me ask you, what would happen to our nation if we did not have the visionary leaders that were willing to reach out into the unknown and to conquer their fears? 
this nation would have never become what it was. You see, I'm fascinated by these maps because this is the genesis of the United States. This is the beginning of the American spirit. This is the start of American entrepreneurialism and free enterprise. This is the birth of the American dream. You see, from our very beginning as Americans, we ventured out into the unknown. We took with us our dreams, our passion. We created a life for ourselves and our families, and our neighbors, and our countrymen, and all those that we came in contact with. We pushed out into the unknown. We continue to push out into the unknown.